Welcome to Let's Talk Learning Technology. Do you know the latest in learning technology? Matt and Walter do. From learning authoring tools and animation to virtual reality and everything in between, innovative learning groups Matt Curtin and Walter Schermacher geek out on all of it. Get their perspectives on the latest trends, tips, and tricks, and recommendations so your learning tech keeps up with the times. Hi, and welcome everyone to LT Squared. I'm Matt Curtin, Senior Director of Technology and Visual Design at Innovative Learning Group. And I'm Walter Schermacher, a programmer at ILG. And with us today is ILG graphic designer, Zach Swisher. Hi, guys. It's great to be back on the podcast. Uh, Thanks for having me. I'm kind of excited to talk about today's topic. Great. Thanks, Zach. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about accessibility for e-learning. Matt, can you start us out by explaining what accessibility is? Accessibility is a set of recommendations for making content usable on the web, primarily for people with disabilities, but it also impacts usability for things like phones or smaller screens. When you're thinking about accessibility and how it might be used for websites and how it might be used for training, it's a little bit different in the purpose. So accessibility of websites means that people who can't see or can't hear or whatever other disability they might have, are going to be able to still use the website to read information, to get a description of pictures, to fill out forms. But when you talk about training, you're also thinking about the interactivity that's going to go into it. And when you get to things like drag and drops or multiple choice questions, the ability to continue that accessibility or usability becomes difficult because there are some things where the interactivity just makes it hard. And in that case, you have to think about whether if there's not a way to make it accessible and maintain the interactivity, do you make an adjusted version? So for instance, maybe replace a drag and drop question with a multiple choice question instead. And at what level do you do that? Do you do that interaction by interaction where there's some branching throughout the course? Or do you do it at a higher level, like the course as a whole, both an accessible version and a version that's not accessible? That's not always easy to figure out the best approach. A lot of thinking can go into that. Walter, as we think about accessibility, one of the important things is the rules or the guidelines for how to do it. Could you talk a little bit about the Section 508 guidelines and the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines? It's actually really interesting how that came about because uh, the Section 508 guidelines came from the U.S. government and it was an effort to make the web accessible for all, no matter what kind of disabilities or challenges they might have. So that after Section 508 guidelines came out, the next thing that happened was we actually got the WCAG compliance levels. And there's been a couple of different drafts of them. But the important thing to know is that there are three main compliance levels. Uh, Level A, which is minimal compliance. There's the double A, which is acceptable. And then what people really want to go for, which is the hard one, is the level triple A, which is really optimal. And each of those breaks down and there's a lot of detail on them. But if you look into it, Uh, There's actually a really good set of standards, not only for those who have maybe challenges accessing getting on stuff on the web, but also for everyone else, too. So, Zach, I know that you and Matt worked on a project to help one of our clients create accessible storyline templates. Can you talk a little bit about your involvement in that project and uh, what are some of the things you had to include to make the templates accessible? Yeah, sure. That was actually a pretty fun one because I feel like it did have a lot of elements that um, of accessibility. And it's kind of like a, a who's who of accessibility guidelines that we had to follow. You know, on the surface level, they can seem like they're just very technical things to follow. Pretty standard, pretty easy. However, once you get to client content, it can be kind of a whole other can of worms to try and apply those to the content. So just some general things. Color contrast is critical. I think we've all run into instances out there on the web or video or wherever where it's just really hard to read any sort of text. Um, And you tack on a visual impairment to that, and it can just be flat out impossible for some to see. From a design perspective, too, color can really establish hierarchy and kind of set up some visual cues to kind of guide the learner's eye through the material. Walter, like you mentioned, the WCAG guidelines do have some different, very specific sets of restrictions for those color contrasts. Um, It depends which level of compliance you're going for. There's lots of really great tools and websites out there that can do that testing for you, which makes it a little bit easier. Another thing you really have to watch out for, too, especially in the digital realm, is the size of the text. Usually we say about 12 points or about 16 pixels is kind of the standard for body text that you want to go down to. Another thing to keep in mind is you really want to use more of a sans serif type font. 
And really, that just means they don't have a lot of decorative flourishes. We call those tails and feet. Uh, some examples are like Verdana, Ariel, Tahoma, Helvetica. Yeah, those are just some general text guidelines. Another thing we had to establish was captions. Um, those are really important. Just to kind of have, it's another thing that there's a lot of automated tools out there nowadays where they really help you speed that process up. <laughs> another thing that was, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine because it's one of those things you don't really notice until it's gone, uh, but tab order. And basically what that is, is how you navigate from one section to the next. Let's say if you don't have a mouse or you have um, some sort of impairment that would prevent you from doing so, from using a mouse to guide through a course. So it's just, it's a function that would either have a screen reader or even just a tab button guide from one section to the next. And you don't really notice it until you're in a form, you're trying to type through something really quickly and boom, you jump to a new section or something's just completely off. So it is one of those things where it's very handy even for someone who's just guiding through a document and just trying to get through it as quickly as possible. Some forms when you build them will just build it and you build it out and it'll actually put all the form fields and stuff in top to bottom. And we'll put them into the correct order from left to right or right to right. left, you know, how your form is. And yeah, a tab order can drive people crazy when they, and that the idea with the tab is that you type something and you hit tab to go to the next form field. And if it doesn't go to the correct field, then it's like, then you start typing and then your information's all in the wrong spot. Exactly. And, you know, sometimes it, it'll be perfect, but then you edit some fields, make some changes to the content and it'll jumble them all up. So it's just one of those things where it's a good last step, but it's an important last step to do. I'd like to tag onto that, too, because you mentioned the case of um, not an inability to use the mouse. But if you can't see it all, it's critically important that the tab order be right, because yeah. tabbing from place to place to have the text on screen read out loud, it's going to be out of order if the tab order is not right. Also, I wanted to touch on the point that you mentioned about the captions. So, so there's features both transcripts and closed captions, and it might not be immediately obvious why you would need both of those, but they really serve two different needs because the, the closed captions are going to be of benefit if you need to read what the audio is saying, for instance, while a video is playing or while an audio is playing. But the transcript is better for people who cannot see and they need to have it read out loud. That would not work well with the captions. So in order to be accessible, you really have to have both transcripts and closed captions for any audio that plays during a course. Right, right. There's actually an effort to have audio and captions turned into sign language. So there oh, wow. are automated tools to actually do automatic signing so that if you need that, then it can actually be generated for you. That sounds like very helpful as a way to choose to have your captions shown that way. So that was kind of just my rundown. I don't, Matt, I don't know if you had anything to add into that. No, I mean, I think there are clearly a lot of things that go into meeting the guidelines, and we really touched the like the two percent of them, maybe. So far, the the guidelines are very extensive. We are going to include links to the WCAG and the Section Five Hundred Eight guidelines in the resources. One of those resources is going to be the voluntary product accessibility template. And Walter, I wanted you to talk a little bit about how you could determine if an e-learning tool is accessible by using that VPAT or the voluntary product accessibility template. So the, yeah, I think, I think it's an interesting idea, but the, the VPAT is, it's, as you mentioned, it's voluntary. So it's a voluntary product accessibility template. So basically it's, so this is a, a good unified way so that consumers can go through and look and see how accessible a product or service is. So it helps them understand, you know, what what portions of the 508 guidelines are being met. Um, and basically, it's a form that anyone can create and includes the various sections. And you basically say how much of those guidelines you're actually um, meeting. So, so Walter, like what you're saying is, is the producer of that authoring tool, like whether it was Storyline or Captivate or whatever tool, they would create that template and basically list out the requirements of Section 508 or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and say which ones they do or don't meet. Yep. So that becomes a good tool because then if you're trying to compare products or services or other things and say, well, can, you know, will this be useful for me or can I use this or will this meet my requirement? You can actually then look and compare things. So I think the important thing to keep in mind with that is that once you have that voluntary product accessibility template saying what the tool could do, for for instance, what, what Storyline could do, 
You got to remember that you can't do anything that it can't do. That's the maximum of what it's going to be able to do. But then if you start creating slides and storyline, you have to continue to do more to keep it in compliance. So if it is able to provide captions or it is able to provide description for images, but then you don't do it as you're building the pages, you don't get the benefit of its ability to do that. You mentioned before um, that Zach and I had worked on templates. And one of the things that we were doing is creating a template that made use of all the accessibility that Storyline does allow. And, And that helps quite a bit because as you start to make a copy of that template and build your page, Um, It was set up in mind with things like the tab order for all the text that's in as a part of the defaults so that when you replace the question stem with the actual question, it's in the right tab order and so on. But it really is three levels. Is the tool accessible? And then are my templates accessible? And then do I not mess up that accessibility as I'm populating the content that's a copy of that template page? Yeah, I mean, I think it's something we have to keep in mind. I mean, you, you can't just say, oh, it's accessible, I'm good. But it's something, okay, I'm working on this. You know, oh, now I'm making changes. You know, it, will these changes impact this accessibility that I'm saying this is? Since it's something that we're declaring, we you know we want you want to make sure that you stay in in with that. Not only right. you know, through the whole development process, not just the beginning, but all the way through the end. It's constant testing. Yeah. So, so yeah, Zach, what did you find challenging about making pages that look nice, worked well, and stayed accessible? I mean, I know there's the old adage: well, if you want it to be accessible, just just put a page of text out. But yeah, but I think you, I think there's a way you can do a lot more than that. Oh, definitely. Think? Yeah. Like I mentioned before, the rules themselves are pretty clear, but, you know, it's not so easy once you get the content. A pretty good example of that was something as simple as buttons. I think a lot of us take it for granted as we're navigating through any sort of digital sphere where, you know, you just click the button. But it was something that, you know, For example, buttons, you can't really rely on just color for your different focus states. So, for example, how do you know that a button's been clicked? How do you know that a button, you're hovering over it? Those are usually called states. And you can't rely on color because if someone has a visual impairment, they don't always get those same visual cues that someone else would. So even once we got to a point where, okay, I like the state, I like the way this button looks, it seems to look nice with the course. But even once we get there, it, it caused a lot of hiccups with the screen reader. So we're even, you know, like we mentioned the testing, we would go through and test. And then when we discover that the screen reader would sometimes want to read all those different states, even when they, they were just navigating through the course, they didn't want to select that button. So again, you just got to be really mindful of that. We kind of found that keeping it simple was kind of the best approach. Does the button need that many states in order for someone to navigate it easily? Perhaps, maybe not. But that was just something that was kind of a fun thing to get through. It was a challenge. And then there was definitely a lot of back and forth. We tried making it an image. We tried making it text. We tried putting whole new layers in there. Yeah, it it just was it was kind of an interesting thing to do. But I think in the end, it did kind of work out. But, you know, that's that's kind of a little bit more storyline specific. I didn't know, Walter, if you had any insights on the difference between maybe how Captivate would compare to that or just some of the general accessibility rules between the two programs or? Um, So yeah, Captivate actually does include some accessibility. It's actually in what's called Captivate Classic now. There's a option where you can go in and basically check, make it, you know, accessible. And that helps turn on things so that it actually has like descriptions for the buttons and, and other things like that. But beyond that, you have to do the exact same thing you do in Storyline, which is you have to be very conscious of, well, uh, you know, what things should I include? Like in Captivate, you can include captions for audio or video. But if you don't include that, then, you know, it's not going to be very accessible. And the same thing with buttons. If you just use color and don't include like check marks or something to include that, to indicate that you completed something, you know, it's not going to work. So Captivate does have a decent amount of accessibility features, but you have to really, you know, watch what you're doing in there. So and of course, you need to check that checkbox to include those. And I will point out that both Storyline and Captivate do provide uh, VPATs, the Voluntary Product Accessibility Templates, which will be in our resources so you can take a look at how they compare. I mean, overall, I think Storyline's a little bit ahead, in my opinion, than Captivate just because it can, it gives you a little bit more options with certain things and a a little bit more customization than you can with the classic Captivate. But of course, Captivate has a new version coming out and uh, we'll see where that goes. So, um, Zach and Matt, um, what tools can you use to test courses for accessibility? Like I mentioned before, there's 
there's a lot of different ways. Even just in some of the stuff that I use specifically for graphics, uh, a majority of Adobe apps, their whole creative cloud, they have their own native contrast checkers for colors. It's just kind of an easy way to just give it a little once over before you were to import it into a course. But then outside of that, once you actually have a course to test, as far as getting things on the web and using things on a browser, I use Chrome a lot. Uh, other web browsers have similar similar tools to use, but there are they are just endless. There's one called Font Inspector, which is a really good way to just kind of test, uh, kind of comb through your HTML code and just kind of see, make sure all your fonts are at an appropriate size and are accessible. Even the WCAG has their own set of tools too, which is really wonderful. They have their own color checker tool, so you can kind of toggle what level you want to be at, what are the colors. Then there's also just manual things where you can enter in the color contrast codes. Yeah, but there's a vast amount out there, and it just seems like they're growing too, the number of them. And I, Zach, you and I had recently a really interesting conversation about the automated tools to help check whether you're in compliance, because we know that there's tools on the browser that can check if the web page is out of compliance. If you're working in a tool like Storyline and you want to try to catch whether you're going to be out of compliance, it would be really handy to have those tools be in the authoring tools so you can catch it then instead of in the published course. But right. what we're talking about is this, if you're trying to check if text is on a right background so it'll be easy to read, but you have animations happening behind that or things sliding around, it's going to be very hard for it to tell whether it's going to have the right contrast when those things happen. By the same token, probably if you have uh, animations going on in the background, you're already creating some problems for accessibility. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, pretty similar to video in that restraint too, where it's, it's you can only kind of take it frame by frame to kind of see is this current frame in compliance or not. It's, yeah, it would be a challenge to include that in a tool. Also, it makes me think, Zach, about kind of the best practices for, because because you're a graphic designer, you're working on images all the time, that you, you need to have descriptive tech for, text for each image to say what, what that image is about for people who can't see it. But then if it's a decorative image, you, you don't have to. What kind of challenges does that create for you? Right. So that's another issue. I don't even think we've touched upon this, um, but it just tells you how vast this uh, topic is. Alt tags are what they're called. Essentially, it's just a way for a screen reader or really anyone with a visual impairment to just get a gist of an image or I, I, I don't believe probably video too. It's more frame by frame, though. So it probably is just more for images, but it, it just gives it a brief description. Uh, for example, someone working at a desk, someone typing at a desk, it might details aren't super. They don't go super in depth, but it just gives you a general idea. But yeah, that's also another thing that is commonly forgotten uh, in the process. So there are actually tools that can comb. Again, this is more of like a published course, but they can actually comb to see if your images do have alt tags. But it is it is uh, an important step to take, especially if the images have a little bit of value um, or you're trying to demonstrate something. I expect um, in our cases, most often the instructional designer is providing the alt text that goes, or in some cases you might take a stab at it and have them validate. But this could be a spot in the future too, where AI will have an impact as it may write the first draft of what the text descriptions are, and then someone just needs to proof that. Right. And I actually think there's a few tools already that are just automating, you know, just kind of creating those for you. Um, I, I, I believe it's Storyline that's doing that. PowerPoint does it as well, I believe. If you are in a show mode, it'll kind of do that. I haven't seen any bad instances of it, but it is a little strange when it does it for you. Uh, there's not a lot of, you know, it's, I didn't have any say, the instructional designer didn't have any say in what that was. I guess it's better than nothing. Right. From a quality details point of view, we would want to have it checked for sure. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And in fact, you mentioned video. And uh, I know one thing that's come up over the years and actually even preceded a lot of the internet stuff was actually descriptive audio for videos. And so a lot of TV shows uh, will actually include like a second audio track where it'll actually describe the scene for those who are having, who can't see it very well. And it usually comes up during the, like the pause between when people are talking in order to like describe a scene or, or what's happening. And that actually originated for, with PBS in Boston way back when. Oh, interesting. And, and, and then actually got picked up by other people. It actually became a standard. Um, with closed captioning has something similar. There's actually um, a separate kind of subtitle that gets put in where you don't just have the words. It'll actually include descriptive text for the scene. In that where sometimes you'll have like 
a regular and you're like, why does this one have it? like every word that's describing it? That's because that's for people who have trouble seeing the scene so they can read it. It'll include things like, you know, the pop noise or car bank firing or, you know, for all those things that you won't have in regular closed captions, that kind of descriptive text is included for those who have trouble hearing. And, and But it's really good for e-learning as well, because if we have some kind of a sound effect or something, should we include that in the captions or not? I mean, that's, that's just one of those things you have to think about and consider. Especially if it's a cue, you know, uh, you got an answer correct or right or wrong on like an assessment or a knowledge check. It's having that be your sole cue is not always the best option. And if you don't um, have just a narrator, but you have characters who are talking, then you need to say who's the characters that's talking. Right. Yeah, more and more uh, video players and tools are including more, more than one audio track, but also more than one set of closed captions per language. So I also wanted to talk about the um, NVDA screen reader because we were talking about before tools that will test to see if your output is compatible. But w if you would use the NVDA screen reader, which stands for non-visual desktop access, that will let you tab through and ha have it read the text on screen out loud. And th the purpose of that is really testing as a learner to see what it would be like for them. So when we were working on our storyline templates, I actually went in to the pages that we had made and closed my eyes and used the tab button and the arrow keys to navigate around. And it really brings home the point about what's easy and what's hard when you can't see. Because if there's just text to be read on screen, fine, it, it, it reads it aloud, you tab to the next one. But for instance, if you had a multiple choice question, and it reads the question, and then you go over to read some of the answers, you really need to read through all the answers to know what the choices are and navigate back to select them again, and it's going to then start reading it again. On top of that, one of the things that you might not know if you haven't tried out the screen readers is that it doesn't necessarily read a whole block altogether. If the paragraph is too long, it's only going to read a certain amount and then stop, pause for you to absorb it, and you have to hit a key to have it read more. So you're, you're kind of playing that game of, okay, am I done this topic um, or is there more to hear before I'm done? I guess I would say until you have tested out what it feels like using that, you don't really have a sense of how difficult it is for somebody who can't see. And you also pick up those things like you were pointing out, Zach, on the states where there's extraneous bits of stuff that the screen reader is going to read because there's a state there that it has to be described that you went to it, but there's no content in it. Very frustrating to have anything that you're not really trying to hear popping up in there. That whole project was a very big learning experience for me. I, you know, just even the questions that you mentioned, you, it was something as a designer, I didn't really think about the content. You know, I always just plug in a question, you know, you can check all the accessibility things that I know of, but then thinking about the screen reader having to read each individual option, and that's even before you select one. Just I could understand how we would want to have things as accessible as possible to make it as easy to use. Otherwise, it could be an extremely frustrating thing for someone to navigate through. I mean, if you throw on top of the multiple choice, if it's not a single answer, if it's a multiple response, multiple choice question, trying to keep track of, OK, have I read all the choices? Have I what ones did I already select before? Did I get them all right before I submit? Just a lot to think about. The goal real, really here is for people, for, you know, the training we're producing is all training to improve performance for employees on the job. If the person can do the job with those disabilities, it would be terrible if they can't get trained on the job because the training can't align with what they need from that standpoint, that you just have to be very careful to do everything you can to support people that need accessibility or usability. Yeah, the NVDA screeners are actually a really good one. It actually has a really interesting history that if you look up the writer of that screen reader was actually blind when he wrote it and he created it because there were screen readers at the time, but they all had really high costs. And so he was determined to create one that was free and open that people could use. And so they actually superseded and became the default screen reader that people use nowadays. Oh, wow. All right. So I think it was, you know, really good, interesting discussion. We, you know, we, we talked about the Section 508 guidelines and the WCAG guidelines. And uh, Zach, you talked a lot about graphics and audio and all the various things that go into it. And the VPAT, of course, is something we have to think about screen readers and testing. And, you know, I mean, it is it is a large topic and it's a very important one, not only for e-learning, but also just for the web in general. If you want to learn more about accessibility, we've posted a bunch of resources at the bottom of this episode's page, including links to the resources we've created, as well as accessibility guidelines, links to the VPAT for Storyline, Rise, and Captivate, 
and information on contrast checkers and screen readers. If you're interested in accessibility, these are resources you will not want to miss. As always, if you have any learning technology topics you'd like us to talk about, Walter and I are on LinkedIn. You can also send us an email at marketingandinnovativelg.com. Thank you for listening.